Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy, where today is part three of our AP government series, and we will look at the Articles of Confederation and the Constitutional Convention. So last time we left off with the Declaration of Independence, again, one of nine foundational documents that you are required to know for your AP exam. And this time we will look at the next one chronologically, the Articles of Confederation, as well as the Constitutional Convention, because as you will quickly see, the articles just plain didn't work. The Founding Fathers knew that the Declaration of Independence would lead to war with Great Britain, and that in order to fight a war and to create a new nation, that they would need a new central or national government, and in the age of constitutionalism, that meant creating one. The 13 colonies who had been used to kind of ruling themselves almost somewhat as their own nations rather reluctantly formed a confederation, which is a, a system of government in which regional, in this case states, hold most of the power. And the weaknesses of this document were apparent from the beginning, as General Washington had to beg Congress for supplies to fight the British, but they had no money, and we'll see why in a second. And we also see the reluctance of the states by the fact that it took them almost five years to ratify this document while war was going on. Okay, so for your exam, you will need to identify the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint with a wide variety of materials are available at Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link below this video. So under the authoritative sounding quote unquote League of Friendship, as they call themselves in the articles, one of the biggest things to remember is that the states under the Articles of Confederation retained most of the power or sovereignty with a very weak central or national government. So what could this government do? Well, it could declare war and treaties, and we'll see why that was so difficult in a minute. And it also created a unicameral or one house legislature. So it had the power to create laws, but there was no governmental institutions or branches to enforce these laws or to even judge them. In addition to this lack of enforcement, the central government under the Articles of Confederation lacked the power to regulate commerce and trade between the states, and probably most importantly for your test, is they lacked the power to tax. In effect, giving it no money to do anything. What is a government without any money? As we mentioned, with no money to tax, they had no way to supply their army, and after the war, they were basically bankrupt. They could borrow money from the states and other countries, which they did to a certain extent, but who wants to lend money to a government when they don't have the power to collect any? The breaking point came after the war in an event known as Shays Rebellion, in which ex-soldiers who had been paid with worthless money to fight to create the United States were in danger of losing their farms in western Massachusetts, who did have the power to tax. And when they got home, they rose up in rebellion. Again, that's called Shays Rebellion after their leader, Daniel Shays. Unfortunately, the central government, lacking money to support a military force, were powerless to stop them. And for many, this was the final straw and a rallying cry to create a more powerful national government. So the delegates met in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia to address these problems and to revise the Articles of Confederation. This gathering included what your test may refer to as the Grand Committee. And after some prodding by James Madison, George Washington, the hero of the nation, showed up and provided legitimacy for this convention, as well as his friend, the beloved Benjamin Franklin. However, it would turn out to be James Madison who was the guiding force of this document's drafting, earning him the nickname, the father of the Constitution. And the delegates made Washington the president of the convention a smart political move as no state would dare question his motive despite the convention being closed to the public and to the press. 
So many of the delegates and states they represented had trepidations about creating a more powerful central government. After all, they had just fought a war to overthrow one. And this was the reason the Articles were purposely weak. Again, states, which had been used to governing themselves, were reluctant to hand over power to a new, more authoritative national government. Small states feared being dominated by large states. Southern states feared that the northern ones might want to do something about slavery. And everyone was afraid of the possibility of a return to a despotic national government that might abuse their rights like they had been under the British. So for your exam, you will need to know the compromises that were made to create the U.S. Constitution. All of the delegates agreed that the federal government needed the power to tax. And we'll look at that in upcoming lectures. But some issues that were contentious, such as how do you create a stronger national government without interfering with state sovereignty? And how would representation in Congress be decided? And again, what were they going to do about slavery? On the issue of representation in Congress, it came down to states with big populations versus those with small populations. Well, James Madison had his fellow Virginia delegate, Edmund Randolph, introduce his outline for the new government known as the Virginia Plan, which you need to know. And this created three branches, very much established that the federal government would take on. However, Madison would propose a bicameral or a two-chamber Congress, one that would allow the two houses to check each other. And bicameralism is a concept that we'll come back to later. But he proposed representation in both be based on population. After all, Virginia and the large states, which Madison represented, would have to pay more taxes. And therefore, they argued that they should have a larger voice in the legislative body. Well, this was exactly what the smaller populated states had feared. And they countered with what became called the New Jersey Plan, in which Congress would remain a unicameral legislature in which each state would have equal representation as it had been under the Articles. The compromise you need to know is what's known as the Great Compromise, or sometimes it's called the Connecticut Compromise. Delegate Roger Sherman from Connecticut proposed a two-house legislature. One, the Senate, would be based on equal representation, satisfying the small states. And the other, the House of Representatives, would be based on population, giving us the Congress that we have today. Now, did it make everyone happy? No, but... It was the compromise that worked and has lasted for 230 years. Another one of the most daunting tasks would be the makeup and the election of the executive branch headed by the president. After all, to many, this position sounded just a little too much like a king or a monarch. And some proposed a panel of executives. But the need for one individual to take decisive action finally won out, and we'll look closer at this again down the road. The other question was how to choose or elect this person. Some wanted state legislatures to decide or the U.S. Congress, but the overall argument that the people must have a voice won out. The problem was that many of these elite delegates didn't necessarily trust this largely uneducated agrarian population to make this decision. So the compromise was the Electoral College, in which the people indirectly vote in a system in which each state has a number of electors based on the number of representatives they have in Congress. So states with larger populations have more electoral votes and those electors are supposed to vote for whoever wins the popular vote in that state but the question is do they have to for the founding fathers this was a compromise that would give the people a voice but also left in a little bit of a safety gap but again we're gonna look at the electoral college when we get down to the president and politics Are you sensing a pattern here? So why did the Founding Fathers create this complex and sometimes confusing system? 
It showed their mistrust for the general public, and that would fit into our elite form of democracy that we discussed in an earlier lecture. Finally, let's look at the slavery question and the compromises made over this terrible legacy in U.S. history. The word slavery is never used in the Constitution, but two compromises were written into it. The first was mainly about representation in Congress and how to count the slave population. Southern states wanted to count slaves in order to gain a greater voice in the House of Representatives, and therefore in the Electoral College, although not necessarily counting them towards paying taxes. A compromise was reached in which each slave would be counted as three-fifths of a person in determining population. And the last compromise to know is about the importation of slaves. The practice was protected by the Constitution for 20 years, at which point it was banned. And yet, we know this did not resolve the issue, which we will look at when we get to civil rights era and civil liberties. One that, sadly, was only resolved by America's bloodiest war, the Civil War. So, one last question that was on the minds of some of the delegates, like the author of Virginia's Declaration of Rights, George Mason, who ultimately refused to sign the document, was where were a Declaration of Rights? After all, many states had a list of protected rights in their state constitutions. We're going to come back to that question, too, and its ultimate solution, which you probably already know. But the truth is that most of the delegates were just ready to go home after a hot summer of debate. Finally, the Constitution was completed and signed. However, three prominent delegates refused to add their signature, foreshadowing the looming debate that would arise over whether the Constitution would be ratified by the states which will be the topic of our lecture next time. But I want to leave you on this note. It's important to remember that this debate over granting powers to the national government, once reserved to the states, continues to this day. And, as you probably guessed, we will discuss it later on this year. But, for now, let's review. What was the condition of the country leading into the Constitutional Convention? Well, the government was basically broke. States were competing against each other commercially. I know we didn't really talk about that, but anyway, and there was no army to put down Shays' Rebellion. Why? They couldn't pay for one. Name three famous delegates at the convention. Well, that's easy. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison. Note that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams weren't there. What was the name of the first constitution of the United States? Well, it was the topic of this lecture, the Articles of Confederation. What were some weaknesses of this constitution? They only had one branch, no way to enforce the laws that they made. They had no power to tax, so they were broke. Some things we didn't mention. It took nine out of 13 states to make laws, a unanimous vote for amendments, and there was no way to support a national military. This event demonstrated to America that the Articles were too weak. Shays' Rebellion. What was the Virginia Plan's idea for representation in Congress? Well, it was a two-house legislature, but both would be based on population. What was New Jersey's plan? A unicameral legislature based on equal representation. How did the Great or Connecticut Compromise solve this? It came up with a bicameral Congress that we still have today with the House of Reps based on population and a Senate based on equal representation. What is the system for choosing the executive called? The Electoral College. What two compromises were made over slavery? The Three-Fifths Compromise and that slave trade would be protected until 1808. And that is it. I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to subscribe because up next we are going to look at the ratification debates. Things are going to get political. Federalist papers, which are more of your foundational documents required for your exam. A little look at the Constitution and more. And just a reminder, teachers that this PowerPoint with lesson plans, quizzes, test bank activities, and more are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just click the link below this video. Search for Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy at Teachers Pay Teachers. Thanks again for watching, guys.